Welcome, 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 players, to Is a Game. Is a Game podcast is a one of a kind QA inspired by Word Association that invites you to get inside the minds of world class creatives, entrepreneurs, and marketers worldwide. So I'm Izzy, your host, also known as Isabella Di Stefano. I've been in social storytelling and creative for over 13 years, launching campaigns you may have seen, like In Bed with My Calvins, Barbie Life in the Dream House, and Selfie by the Chainsmokers. Okay, so today I am flipping out with excitement and also really nervous to introduce my latest guest, Patrick McGinnis. He's an author, entrepreneur, venture capitalist, podcaster, and he literally invented the word FOMO. No, I am not joking. Patrick, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are. First of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I am, you, you kind of did my work for me, but you know, the only parts you really missed are I grew up in a small town in Maine, came to New York City, and on the way I fell in love with Latin America. So I started investing in startups in Latin America, eventually moved into the US, and now I am an investor, I'm an author, and fun fact, I've been to 106 countries. I read this. Yeah. So do you have a map at home where you take to keep track of, I have a globe. of I have a globe with pins, but I haven't put the 106 one. I'm, that's still 105. So I got to go. So you got to, you got to actually, my grandpa had the same thing. He had this massive map in his house and he had also traveled the world and he had little pins for everywhere that he went. I love to travel. I'm half Italian and a very international person. I moved around a lot as a young kid, the mm. good and the bad side of that. Mm. Um, and so I really appreciate really learning about new cultures and immersing myself in different cultures. So tell me what interested you about Latin America and what do you look for in startups today? The Latin America thing, you know, I grew up in this small town, 20,000 people. I took Spanish class and then I saw the play Vida when I was like 10 years old at the local playhouse and I got interested in Argentina. And I remember I actually wrote this report in freshman year Spanish about, or sophomore year about like my year in Argentina. And it was like writing home to my parents. And I still have that actually. It's quite accurate about what I ended up doing. So that language was my draw. But then when I went to college, I studied abroad there. And I just think the culture of Latin America is just way more human in the same way that Italy is, right? And then the business opportunities there are amazing. What I invest in typically, in the US I do a bit more uh, sort of consumer companies and business services companies and, and stuff like that. But in Latin America, I'm part of an investment firm and we really try to invest in companies that maximize human potential. So whether it's giving financial services and products to people who are at the base of the pyramid or offering online education to upskill people, it's really about taking and offering opportunity for people to live better lives through technology. When you first started investing, what was something, I don't like the word mistake, but I think it's really important to make mistakes. And I read this all the time from mentors that I admire and, you know, failing is so important, mm -hmm. right? Because we learn more from that than we do from succeeding, mm -hmm. essentially. So what was something that you would have done differently? Let's not call it a mistake, but something that you did when you started out that you now learned to do differently. Definitely falling victim to FOMO. So I remember wanting to invest in companies because uh, because other people had invested in them, and but like not really knowing why I wanted to invest. But hey, these really smart people, this other investment firm, they invested, so we don't want to miss out on this opportunity. And so even though I didn't quite have a good rationale for doing that investment, I went ahead and did it anyway. And that everybody did because it was the early 2000s when tech was in a boom, and so people just didn't really think about fundamentals. They just invested in kind of anything. Okay, well, are you ready to play this game? Yeah, Let me explain to you how it works. Yeah. So I came up with a list of words today that are inspired by you and what's happening in the world right now. Okay. And I'm going to show you these cards and you're gonna point to one and then I'll s say the word yeah. and then unfiltered the first thing that pops into your head and then we'll talk about it. 
How does that sound? It sounds risky and exciting at the same time. I like to keep it a little risky. Yeah, I know. I like that. <laughs> risky is good. <laughs> okay, amazing. Let's get started. Get ready. No. Yes. <laughs> Intellect. Intellect. Oh, I like that word. Um, what was the first thing? What was the first thing? Me. <laughs> Me? Yes. Well, that's why I chose the word. Oh, my goodness. So do you consider yourself highly intellectual? I really do. I actually, I can't believe it. This is so embarrassing. But I, so what's funny about me is if you meet me, I'm the guy who will talk like a 15-year-old and then intersperse that with like really deep thoughts and, and intellectual concepts and philosophy. So it's funny because I'll be talking to somebody who's really intelligent and I sound extremely pop culture. And that's because I think I like to be low key and connect with people. And Accessible. Just, exactly. And that's, I think, a great just way to meet more people. But I'm an ideas driven person. I'm super curious and I'm always, I'm so curious. That's probably one of my best qualities. I'm always learning more and questioning. And so I like to think of myself, I do think of myself as a very intellectual person, but in a way that isn't like stuffy, but is more modern. So what was the last thing that you learned that really stands out to you? So today I was in this conversation about democracy in the United States. I'm pretty political. I got involved in a bunch of political organizations over the last couple of years, given sort of the threats to democracy. And today's conversation, I was with an author at this like lunch forum that I co-hosted. He was talking about how essentially, this is really interesting, how everybody focuses on these congressional races. Like say, you know, I don't want to presume people's politics, but say that you you wanted the Democrats to win. People sent tons of money to all of these candidates that, that had no shot of winning, but they had like $100 million to spend. Meanwhile, you know, you give one of those candidates $100 million, people have never spent that much in local races at the state level, but the states actually drive all of the real action when it comes to like voting rights and all these other things. So what I heard today and what I learned was just like how important local politics is when national politics gets all the headlines and the attention. I thought that was really interesting. It's so true. I have to ask, what are your thoughts on the current temperature, what we're dealing with? It's a very tumultuous environment right now. I'm frankly scared. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I can talk to most people of any political persuasion. I've been, I grew up more of a Republican. Now I, I guess I'm a Democrat, but I'm really more of an independent. I just registered to be a, registered to be a Democrat because in New York City, if you want to vote in the local election, like the Democrats win everything. So you, that's how you have a voice. But I'd rather not be part of a party because I have, you know, I like the flexibility of choosing. I feel exactly I want. the same way. But what I would say is that the temperature is very high. And I think what we don't see is that online, and I just interviewed a guy from my podcast who is a TikToker who's quite famous named Walter Masterson who focuses on politics. And he told, he goes to QAnon rallies and Stop the Steel rallies and Proud Boy rallies. And he's like, these people want to go attack the IRS and all these other really like institutions of the state. And so the, the level of political violence that we're going to see in America coming up to the election and beyond is I think unlike anything we've seen before. And so I'm really concerned. It's a bummer because like, if you start to see that kind of political violence, I think you're gonna see America fragmenting even more and it just, our country will get weaker. And that is, we, you know, we can't have a country where people can't talk about things in a rational way. So it's very frightening. Yeah, and it, what's really disappointing to me is also how we are perceived by other countries. I just got back from Europe mm -hmm. and I don't feel respected as an American outside of America because of how embarrassing some of the things that are going on in our country right now. And it feels so outside of our control. But to your point, it's really important to get involved again at the local level to make an impact. I also think that we've lost the humanity in a lot of this. Mm -hmm. We are all human beings and we need to treat each other with respect. And as soon as violence ensues, I lose all respect for the argument. And um, we need to find a way to have a dialogue. And I think that's really what's missing right now and stressing me out. That was a great answer. Thank you. And I love that. Thanks for your political takes. I Thanks. love it.
I didn't even know I could do that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pick your next. Now you know I'm a narcissist. So that, <laughs> that's the takeaway that I think I'm very smart. Well, you are. Very I guess smart. it's better than thinking you're dumb. Like that's actually something somebody once told me. Like I was like, you're your own best friend. If you don't think you're good at things, like nobody else will. So like always just support yourself. And somebody was like, I'm my own worst critic. And I was like, that is not the place you want to be. So like. Maybe I'm a little think I'm great, but like I'd rather that than think I'm dumb. I love that you said that because that's actually something that has been an evolution for me mm -hmm. in my career. And I'm now at a place where I go into things with confidence and I say, I'm really great at this, FYI. And this yeah. is how I can add value. It took me a really long time to actually own that. You know, I've worked in corporations over the last 13 years and I haven't necessarily felt empowered to act that way. And the idea of sort of fitting into this mold and this corporate structure that we were uh, taught that you start as an intern and then you're an assistant and then you rise to be an assistant manager. And then you, and then what I learned throughout that process, actually, especially as a woman, is that you hit the ceiling really fast. And I think if you are really intelligent or creative, it's really hard to fit into that mold. I mean, this is a little bit different, the quiet quitting thing. Yes. We'll get into that in a second. Yes. But people don't want full-time jobs. They want to work remotely. They want to be freelance. The idea of this corporate structure being the goal is kind of going away. I'm curious what your thoughts on that because I see some business leaders still fighting for, no, everyone's coming back to the office. You just watch. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, me. It's what are your thoughts? on that front. Like, I actually think being in the office is a good thing. So on that, I would, I'm going to carve that out and put that over here. Like I've been working remotely on a bunch of different things. And every time we all get together, I, I just am amazed at how much more we get done. So yes. th that is, that's just a thing. So I understand why the Jamie diamonds of the world are saying they want their teams back, but around this quiet quitting and around sort of the corporate path, what I learned, because I did the corporate path for a long time, I did a very traditional path. I worked at JP Morgan, I worked at AIG, I, you know, I did all that stuff and I was fine at it. And then in the end, it all blew up on me. And what I learned through that process, and this is a little bit harsh, but I'll just say it, is that mostly the corporate pathway is designed for a pretty good to pretty good plus kind of player who just sticks it out. And the very poor people don't make it and the very good people leave to do something where they have more autonomy and control and upside. And so, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, it is shocking to me how few of my colleagues really stayed and they're smart people, but they endure because once you've had a taste of freedom and you know what it's like to make your own day, you just can't go back to that. I can't because my creativity has no limits. My imagination has no limits. And I was living and operating in a world where they constantly were like going back to, well, that is not your job. Yeah. Well, that just focus on your job. But I can do more than that. Yeah, and when, you, and when you're working with somebody, there's really no upside to doing anything extra because like if they don't value it, it can actually be a detractor. If you work for yourself, then have at it because you're just creating more value that accrues to you. That's how I burned out is that I just would always go 200%, 200%, and I it wasn't valued. Yeah. And I would get frustrated and feel demoralized and, you know, and, like, undervalued, ultimately. So I do agree with you about returning to the office. I have to say the 13th floor at Calvin Klein was a really special place, mm -hmm. and I miss that because it was, it was so loud. It was always people were walking up to people's desks like, hey, what do you think of this? Let's, what do you think of this idea? I love it. Let's do it. Let's go into the conference room and figure it out, you know, and just make shit happen. And that was energizing. And that, when you're working solo in a more freelance capacity, you don't, you don't get those experiences as much. I'm really curious to see how the next six to 12 months shake out and what happens to the workforce. I think massive layoffs are, have already begun. Yeah. And so that's also my fear of going back to corporate. It's like, what, just to get laid off? Yeah, hundred percent. It's know? coming, it's coming. It's, com it's, ha it's happening already, you know? Okay, next word, pick a card. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to go to the bottom one. 
Okay. Please. The bottom one? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> iPhone. Oh. oh. Evil. Okay, talk to me oh, about I, that. Oh, okay, this is a good topic. Okay. Yeah. You're, you are just, she's very good at her job. Oh, All thank right, you. I want to show you my iPhone. Let's see it. S'appelle Mon Petit iPhone. Pourquoi? Parce que c'est petit. That's, you know, I'm speaking He French. just said, my little iPhone, it's small. So tell me, what is going on here? So I, I talk a lot about the impact of FOMO, and I talk about productivity. And in my work, I've written about that. I speak about it. And, you know, I am the ultimate device addict. And so I, um, I hate when people are on their phones. And in fact, I've really done a, a, it's been a real project over the last several years to spend less time on my phone to the point where people now say to me, God, you're never on your phone anymore. And I'm like, well, they, that's a problem. I've been working on that. The reason I bought this little phone is because I said to myself, you know what I don't need more of in my life? Phone. I got a lot of phone. I'm, I'm always on the phone. Let me find a way, especially after the pandemic when I lived on my phone, to basically make it less enjoyable to be on my phone. And so this little screen, like nobody's going to want to watch a video or a movie on a phone like this. And so it's almost like a dumb phone in a sense that I really only use it for the essentials. My screen time is way down. And so I love my iPhone, don't get me wrong, but I, I, my iPhone doesn't own me, I own it. And I'm very careful about how it's used. It never comes to the bedroom. Because the other thing about phones is we use them as an alarm clock, but that's the Trojan horse that causes the phone to come into your room. And when it's there, then, oh, let me just check my email. Oh, it's four in the morning. Like if I have my phone in my room, five in the morning, I wake up, I'm gonna be on email, I'm gonna be on Instagram. I know myself. So I keep it in the kitchen. I use Alexa as my alarm. Hmm. She's so great. I need to do, Alexa scares the shit out of me. I gotta she tell is, you. She's my girl. But she listens. Like I she had some- She listens to me all the time. She's so sweet. I should have, <laughs> I've had some weird experiences with Alexa, but that's really interesting. It makes me, my mind is buzzing, but I'm thinking about the flip phone and mm -hmm. should we go back to this more analog experience, which is a trend that I'm also seeing amongst Gen Z and that I'm really interested in. I call it now nostalgia. Ooh. So, yeah. Oh, that's, that's, it, that's a great term. <laughs> Thanks. Use it. All right, well. Let's spread it. Let's, let's make it a thing. You should trend that. I, I trademark that. No jokes. Really? Yeah, I don't know. I have a, I have a lawyer. Okay, that. let's discuss that. <laughs> um, I love that idea. Yeah, it's basically the concept that we're seeing content that can speak across generations. And that, to me, is what now nostalgia is. Mm. It's Gen Z being nostalgic, quote unquote, for, you know, the 90s and the flip phone, the camcorder, which is now nostalgic for them because mm -hmm. it feels cool because it's like a relic from the past that they're bringing into the now and it's actually nostalgic for us so emotionally as a storyteller i try to always lead with emotional content and narrative authentic stories because i'm interested in how you can move people and connect with other people in a, in a real way and i love now nostalgia because i can inspire or move my mom at the same time as making the 20 year old feel something too. That's really interesting to me because, you know, in social media, we see all these filters of like, make it look like a disposable photo and disposable cameras are even coming back. It's like a thing, mm -hmm. Polaroids. I've worked with a lot of talent who like, they carry around like an old camcorder and it's this like grainy, more analog, almost going back in time, which is interesting because we're moving really quickly into the future too. I don't know what your thoughts are on the metaverse, but I'd love to hear them. Oh, the metaverse. Well, I do want to mention one product. I was out at the Brooklyn Navy Yard last week. They have this place called New Labs, which is like all these very innovative products. We have like a co-working and I met this company called The Light Phone. And it is a phone that only does texting and calling. That is it. And so they've been selling, I'm gonna actually like learn more about it because I was really fascinated. But I think there is a space for that because if you're a severely addicted to technology, like you just can't have it. It's almost like if you're a smoker and you've quit, like you can't carry around a pack of cigarettes. No. And so I'm not saying you have to give up technology cold turkey. Of course not. What you have to do is re 
recalibrate your relationship and in a sustainable way for you according to what your needs are. Um, so that's really important. When it comes to the metaverse, the metaverse is so interesting. So let me tell you, I dipped a little toe into the NFT world this year. When you know, I, I was I became an advisor to a company in the space. They gave me my first NFT, and then the next day, crypto crash happened, and I was like, well. <laughs> Never, womp womp. never follow me is the point. But um, so I, I find all this very interesting. I was reading about Mark Zuckerberg just put out this new avatar and these new notions of the metaverse and people are kind of panning it. And then over the years, people have made, if you think about Second Life, if you remember that, mm -hmm. and then there was um, Magic Leap. There's been mm -hmm. all these attempts to do metaverse and nobody's quite pulled it off. Now, part of that's just that the technology is not there yet and so when you go into the metaverse you know the the user experience as it stands today is not going to be one that most people find deeply resonant it will be for some people but not for like my mom or whatever mm -hmm. not for me maybe the metaverse isn't a place i want to spend 35 hours a weekend but i do think that like what's what's i guess what's missing here is like nobody has explained to date i think to the general public why and how we will be using the metaverse in the future. I mean, we hear some use cases like somebody practicing surgery, which sounds amazing. And I'm like, I'm on board with that. But like, I think really how we're going to be coexisting with it in the future remains unclear to me. It is clear that it's coming for us and, and that there are some real positives to that, especially for people who are, for example, somebody who is unable to leave their home for some reason, like the metaverse is going to change their whole life. It's amazing. But I just don't know yet. I haven't seen the sort of use case that makes me want to like, you know, for example, I know friends that work at Meta, they do all their calls on Oculus and stuff like that. Like, that sounds horrible to me. I'm not interested in that. But as the, as the hardware gets better, as the use cases are stronger, I'm sure we'll all be spending more time there. Yeah, I... I don't know. I'm so excited. Uh, do you follow Ray Kurzweil at all? I do a little. So I watched his documentary many years ago and was so inspired and it scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that in 2040, we will reach the singularity where there is no longer a clear definition between the human and the computer. And that's kind of already happened mm -hmm. um, in a way because he, computers in some ways, like they can replicate consciousness, right? We're starting to see computers like have emotions, mm -hmm. which is really bizarre. And at first it scared the shit out of me. And then I thought, well, this is really interesting. And I also better get on board because it is coming, whether we like it or not. And so I need to be one with it and learn how to live in that space to succeed, right? Because I also think, to your point, the technology is not there, but consumers haven't been ready for it either. And I remember Steve Jobs talking about this a lot, how you have to anticipate consumers' needs. It's not about creating what they want. It's creating what they don't know they want. But they also have to be at a point where they're ready for that. So, like, there are so many things happening from a technology standpoint that we don't even know about because we're just not. It would absolutely terrify people and they would just shut it down. But I think what is happening with the metaverse is actually going to take off really fast. Mm -hmm. And then I think if you don't get on board, you're getting left behind in a way because it's the future. I don't know if that's super out there. I super get that. My, I have two thoughts on that. Now, thought number one is this. Remember Clubhouse? Mm -hmm. And everybody said, you got to be on Clubhouse. And I felt all this pressure to be on Clubhouse. And then I was like, I don't like Clubhouse. And I didn't join. Or I was on it. And then I was like, this is really time consuming. Like eh. It was very time consuming. Like, who has time for that? And so I ended up leaving it. And now Clubhouse, like, nobody talks about Clubhouse, right? So I do think that there is going to be a lot of, like, Clubhouses in that world. So, like, you, we all should be prepared for, like, there will be lots of false starts. Yes. I agree with you. Like, the train's leaving the station. And, like, we should embrace technology because, like, you just have to always be in the flow, even if some of the stuff's going to not happen. But the second one, which I think is really interesting and scary, really scary, is the use case of the people who start to exist more and more within the metaverse. And what I worry there is if they become disconnected with society, right? that's really bad. And like, so how do you, how do you manage that? People get corrupted online. 
they become radicalized. Yes. They, be, they have disassociation with real life, all this other stuff. And so there's going to be a lot of vulnerable people who, because they spend all their time in the metaverse, are going to be like deeply affected and potentially like deeply traumatized and or mentally, they're going to have like mental health issues. And I worry about that because we are not prepared for that. That I, to- I totally agree. It's such a delicate balance, right? Because I think that keeping up with the technology is also a form of survival. Um, yes. Because I agree. Ray Kurzweil said computers are kind of going to take over, right? Whether we like it or not. So we need to go in step with that and learn how to be in the world that we're creating online too because we're also destroying planet Earth. So... Like thinking further and further into the future, but I totally agree with you that there's a real mental health risk there because then people don't know how to operate in the real world. But then part of me thinks, well, what's going to happen to the real world? Because we're destroying it. I don't know. Maybe I'm going too far with it, but that's kind of where my head goes. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's clearly, uh, it's very interesting to see how people are waking up to the environmental risks. And so where will that go? But if the world is no longer and we can't get off of it, then there won't be a metaverse either. Yeah, true. Dead. Dead. We'll all be dead. But we'll all be dead by then. None of us will be here for that. Inshallah. Okay, next word. Go, go, go. Top one. New York Fashion Week. I think of, um, I just thought of, of a fashion show. I mean, that's so boring. Sorry, that one's really boring. I just thought of, I went Why to- Why is that boring? You know, okay, well, it's not boring. I guess it's not boring. Okay, so what I thought of was, I went to this market. I never, I've been to one fashion show in my whole life. Were you but it was a doozy. No, Marquesa. Marquesa. And guess who sat just down the little thing for me? Harvey Weinstein. <gasps> Harvey. Because he was with Georgina, who was the creator of Marquesa. And I went to the show and I remember just being so impressed. Because I walked into it. I was like, I know these things are like a society thing and like it's going to be celebrities or whatever. But I'm not a fashion person. I'm not anti-fashion. I'm just not like it doesn't interest me. I don't follow fashion. I don't care. And I was so impressed with the pieces that came through the room and the experience of the show. I was like, wow, these like she's really talented. Yeah. I mean, it's a performance. It, it is, it's an art form. For me, it's a form of storytelling in a different way. It's definitely changed a lot into the brands that are doing it right have made it into something more experiential, Yes, which I think is really interesting. If you can create an immersive experience that invites someone into your brand to kind of understand the DNA, the story, the world, it can transport you and help you kind of understand fashion, Mm -hmm. right? But it's interesting you mentioned Harvey Weinstein. First of all, he hit on me once. Fun fact. I actually can't believe I'm sharing this, but I will. good. (laughs) When I was 18, I found out that you could become a bottle waitress at 18 and serve alcohol. I didn't know that. Yes. You can serve alcohol before you're 21. And I learned that this was very lucrative. And so I did it. It lasted about two weeks before my dad showed up to the nightclub because he found out he's a very overprotective Italian man. And he told them that the FBI was watching them. And if they didn't fire me, they were going to come out. What club was this? PM. Do you remember? Of course. I love PM. I once saw, uh, I was, (laughs) I used to go there all the time. Oh my God. I was a waitress. I got to fight there one time. Really? Yes, it was I I had this period when I used to get really angry. Like I got aggressive with people like for like a hot minute. But like I saw Adriana Lima there, I saw Steve Nash there. That place was hot. It was popping. That was hot. That was my experience with Harvey Oof. Weinstein. What a skis. Yeah. Um but yeah, I actually my first night there, another fun fact, um and why my father was so alarmed when he found out, I was shadowing. I wasn't even on the job yet. And this man was celebrating his son's graduation from NYU. And he asked me to bring him a stack of napkins Mm. to just throw in the air. And I was like, okay. So I bring him stacks of napkins like three times. About 45 minutes later, he comes to the host, like, sorry, the waitress stand, like behind where we would keep all of our things. And I was hanging out there. 
And he said, put your hands out. And I said, okay. And he just starts putting $100 bills in my hands. And I was like, wow. beside myself, the way women are sort of objectified in that way and then sort of like the way that transaction went down, now I understand it. Obviously, at the time, I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah, like, that is- I just gave him napkins. <laughs> but <laughs> but now I look at it and I'm like, okay, that's actually kind of problematic. But I needed the money and, like, wanted to make money. And I learned that this was an opportunity. But it definitely was an interesting experience because PM was, like, the hottest nightclub. It really was. There was no VIP room because the whole darn thing was VIP. VIP. Yes. Yeah. And I can't believe that I love that we're talking about PM right now because this is going to bring some people back. Yeah. I mean, it became the Griffin after, which was, and now it's, like, enough. It's higher mess when was it? Oh, it is? I didn't even know that. Wow, uh, you just took me to a place that I loved. Okay, pick your next card. Ah, uh, let's see. Let's do this one. Okay. Ethereum. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so I think about that guy, the founder of Ethereum. Mm-hmm. His name is like Vitaly Buterik. Mm-hmm. I think about him whenever I think of Ethereum. And what are your thoughts? What do we think of Vitaly? So... I don't know because, again, so I mentioned I got, like, I dipped a toe in the NFTs. I got a little dipping my toe into the world of, I'm not a crypto person. I'm not done crypto. I stayed away from it because I didn't understand it. But I have smart friends who are in it, so I was, like, learning about it and, you know, got a MetaMask ball and all those things. And I started learning about him because friends of mine, I was in a documentary last year that hasn't come out yet about Dogecoin. And because FOMO and investing and stuff like that. So yeah. I was kind of talking about that in the of movie. Course. And they also were working on a film about Vitaly. So I started reading up on him and better understanding how crypto works and all that sort of stuff. Because like you said, you have to know, you have to be aware, you have to learn, even if you're not necessarily an evangelist or a believer or you want to own the thing. And so what I find so interesting is this, once I got the MetaMask wallet and started transacting and like I bought an Ethereum domain and all that sort of stuff. And it's crazy, like if you haven't done it, First of all, I got like a 21 year old to teach me all how to do these things. But I went That's to. That's brilliant. Yes. Yeah, I know. I've like always, I always, I get mentored by younger people all the time. I'm a big I love that. Of like cross generational mentorship. So I get this MetaMask and all, et cetera, all up and put some money and all these things. And I go to buy my Ethereum domain, Patrick J. McGinnis. If you want to send me money, Patrick J. McGinnis. <laughs> and I, it's five bucks a year. I'm like, what a deal. And then I have to pay gas fees of like 50 bucks. And um, because I didn't realize that the transaction costs on Ethereum were really high. I mean, it was like this aha moment for me. And then I hear, oh, no, they're going to fix Ethereum. It's going to be cheaper. And so Vitaly is supposedly fixing that, but we don't know. And so I just think it's fascinating that there's this guy out there who came up with this thing and is like the king of it all. And I respect him for that. And I'm interested in him. And so whenever I think of Ethereum, it just his like face comes in my head. You know what I've been seeing starting to happen that is really interesting? A lot of influencers are creating their own coins mm. have you seen this mm-hmm. and their own currency i don't know if Gary that, v did that right yeah i don't know i, I don't mean, really get that that is so lame yes i sorry agree. gary can we talk about gary v yeah what do you think of gary v oh my goodness okay i'm coming clear now i'm gonna like where, where's the tea i'm gonna spill it over spill here the tea. i got two things to say okay Three things, maybe. <laughs> Numero uno. First of all, like, I get it. I get it. Like, he's incredible. Like, he's built this whole thing. And I don't think he's a bad guy. He's one of those guys who's too busy for his own good. So I met him a couple of years ago. I was interviewing. I was uh, asked to do, like, interviews at a conference for a friend of mine's conference. And I was like, sure. And he was one of the interviews. And I met him. And I was like, hey, I'm the FOMO guy. And he's like, oh, I'd love to talk about that. He's emailed me at this thing. And I emailed him. Never responds. Which is just like, well, then why would you give me your email? Yeah, kind of what thing? was the like, point like, of What that? is that, right? Yeah. Shame on you, Gary. Number I, someone did, did that to me recently, too, form. and they're, I hate that. Bad form. Number two, and I'm sensitive. I get, I get offended. Number two, Gary's people pitched him to come on the pod. My podcast, Homo Sapiens, sent me his book. I looked at it. I was like, I was like, I don't know. After what he did to me, should I have Gary on? But I was like, you know what? Interesting guy. I'll have him on. I said, sure. We'd love to have him on the show. And they then ghosted us. They were like, oh, sorry. Gary's too busy. And I was like, you don't go and do that. That is not nice. 
Bad Hashtag form. Hashtag shocked. Bad form. That's really embarrassing. Yeah, it's not good. Numero trace. Mm-hmm. And this is where I showed incredible restraint. I happened to be with Gary over the summer in Sweden in the forest, believe it okay, or not. Okay, we need to get into that in a second. Yeah. Okay, go, go, go. And I actually chatted with him for a minute, and I didn't mention any of these things. Because I thought to myself, number one, it makes me look like kind of a loser. Like, hey, Gary, you keep ignoring me. I'm so needy. Like, no. Numero dos is that, like, he probably didn't even, I mean, he doesn't manage any. He's just too busy. He's one man. He's got so many people who want his time. Like, I'm just going to cut him a break. But I definitely didn't feel the need to go up and be like, oh, you're so great, right? Like, which I wouldn't do that because, like, he's not so great if he can't, like, keep his calendar straight. And respond to an email because. Or the- hire somebody to respond to the damn email. Yeah. That's pretty shocking to me because he also presents himself as someone who is, like, super hyper communicative, right? If you're a social media, like, leader in that way, that's hyper communication. So you should, your own communication style should follow suit and you should be, you know, someone who responds immediately, even if they're going to say no, right? Yeah. I think that I really don't like that. And someone did that to me recently, too, who I had a lot of respect for and I ran into them. And they talked about, oh, yeah, I'd love for you to work on this. But we had this whole conversation. And then I followed up. And it was not. That is, by the way, like, if you do that to me, I will never forget it. I will, like, Same. If, if I see you on the side of the road and there's a puddle next to you, I'll hit that puddle. Yeah. Because that's such a weight. It's such a waste It's so of, disrespectful. It's so disrespectful. Yeah. And it makes me f- think less of that person that they think they are so you know above responding to it's so triggering because i was like an unpopular child and all i ever wanted was to be liked i'll admit this and now like i have like a very nice social life and lots of friends whatever and i feel very supported and like when you have a podcast people like reach out to you and they're it's awesome like you meet all these people and they like your work and so you get a lot of really nice validation for your work and i really appreciate that and so when somebody is disrespectful like that it just really throws me back into fourth grade dodgeball when they didn't get picked for the team isn't that terrible that's on me though like i can't blame gary for my insecurity i don't know i think I, I think to your point, it's really poor form. I'm curious to hear how that evolved for you. At what age did you stop wanting to be liked and just kind of live your true self and then naturally sort of attract people, I guess, through that? Yeah. When did that happen for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a long and winding road because I I was well, I lost like 50 pounds when I was in high school. And then because I was like quite chunky and I think I was insecure because of that and I lost a lot of weight and I became a really good student and I was like kind of like you've seen the movie Election with Reese Witherspoon Mm -hmm. where like crazy Tracy Flick wants to take over the world from our high school Mm -hmm. that was me and then when I went to college I was like uber competitive and kind of crazy too like I look back and I just who I was very intense then I think what happened for me was in 2008 during the financial crisis like everything in my life blew up and I ended up like I got really sick. I was on a heart monitor for stress. And I just was like, what am I doing? This is messed up. Like my priorities are wrong. And that's when I started kind of reinventing my career myself to focus much more on what I really wanted to do. And so when you're aligned, like I always think when you're conscious and your subconscious are deeply aligned, people like your energy, I know it sounds so like metaphysical and woo woo, but I'll just say it. I think people are attracted to that. And I think that the more that you can just you're like the more that what you do on a daily basis aligns with what you really care about and what you Your love. Values. People, people can they can taste it, and so I found that like a lot of people, people come up to me in like a airport and they'll be like, "You have good energy," and I never that was started like after all. You these do changes. have great energy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Like I do appreciate it because I feel good. And I think that was the process of unlearning and also getting smacked around enough that you have the humility to be like, okay, like I'm just going to enjoy every moment, live in the moment, try to do good things. And so I think, of course, everybody wants to be like, don't get me wrong. But also when you like yourself, that fills most of the gap. Let's do this one. That one. Okay. Canceled. Oh, yeah. You know what? We were kind of, it's kind of related to what we were talking about earlier a little bit around, you know, political discourse and conversation in our civil society. 
And I'm actually on the board of an organization that I'm very proud of. It's called Bridge USA. And what they do is they work with college students to have conversations with people who may just like say hop on topic abortion they will get people who have different views on this topic and to talk to each other to learn how to have a conversation that's amazing and, and it's a really beautiful organization it's started by a guy well he's now 23 he started it as an undergraduate at berkeley and so they they're they they take on cancel culture because the view is that like we shouldn't be canceling people. We should be talking to people and figuring out how to move past our division. And I think I maybe have been a, was a little bit of a canceler for a little while, maybe. Oh, really? Not a canceler, but like I remember at some point or another being like, those people just, I don't even want to hear what they have to say anymore. We cannot find common ground. And I think that that is, was wrong of me. And so um, I'm really interested in moving beyond that because, you know, of course, like what happens is like one day you're the canceler and then the next day you're the cancel E. And nobody should be canceled forever, even like really bad people. We have to think about redemption and opportunity. A hundred percent. So I think that that word for me, it's, it's also a word that gets thrown around and people don't really think about what they're saying when they say it. But I now have come to believe that we have to get away from that. And by the way, that's, there's plenty of room on both sides because, you know, I think people who are on the progressive left you know, that's where there's a lot of problems. I see it all the time. It's actually on both sides now because the, 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 the progressives are canceling people on the right and the people on the right are censoring people on the left. And like, it's just insane. This country's, what's freedom if you can't have a conversation? It's horrifying. To me, it's a, it's bullying. Mm. It is bullying. Yeah. And I don't think that's okay in any environment. I don't care how horrible, but you should not be put on a pedestal and basically pummeled online. No. And it really makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, and the other thing, by the way, is like people with money and power, they never get canceled forever. There's probably like three people, like Weinstein and Kevin Spacey yeah, and probably one other, but like everybody else comes back eventually. Like Army Hammer right now, he's yeah. kind of out, out of commission. But like so many people get canceled and then they're back within a month. They just call it like, you know, like um, uh, John Legend's wife, um, Chrissy. Oh, Chrissy Teigen. Teigen. Like she'll be back. Like yeah. maybe she learned something. Maybe she did. But it's all this act of like, I got canceled. I apologized. I did some like good acts. And then all of a sudden, like I'm coming out with my new Instagram post about my new product. So like, let's just all accept the fact that cancellation is also like kind of BS. Yeah. No, and we don't learn anything and the people don't learn anything. And it's just like, it's just a, another example of Americans like to build people up and only to tear them down. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural thing that we do here. You know, it doesn't really generate any productive outcome. Or break you down. I went to Tish. Um, I actually mm -hmm. wanted to be an actor. Ooh. And I remember them saying to me that the strategy, this was after I got accepted, but the strategy is we're going to break you down to build you up again. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really problematic. Like mm -hmm. you're going to destroy me emotionally just to like rebuild me emotionally. Like mm -hmm. I thought that was weird and it feels similar to that, that we do that to each other. So essentially I hope to always spread positivity yes. and optimism. Yes. Um, I have a few rapid fire questions for you fire away. before we wrap up. So if your life had a tagline, what would it be? Oh, never be bored or boring. Oh, I love that. What's your superpower? Uh, four languages. And close your eyes. Mm. Imagine you're 20 years old. Mm. What do you see? <laughs> I see a very sweet, very preppy kind of kid with a lot of promise. What was your biggest dream, actually? Now I want to know. Like when North you were twenty, what was your what was your north star? It depends because I, I I lived abroad that year. It really changed me. But before I went abroad, my dream was to be a trade negotiator. <laughs> For the U.S. government. Really? <laughs> Negotiating treaties. I loved free trade. It was my passion. I took all the classes. I wrote my papers about that. Yeah, I was like, if there's another NAFTA, I'm going to negotiate that. That would have bored the tears. Okay, out. and then what? Yeah, that doesn't seem on brand. Then I went to Argentina, and it was like, you know the movie Grease? Like, mm -hmm. I was Sandy. I, I went in, like, wearing, like, khakis and a white hat, and I came out wearing, like, a leather jacket and, like, 
you know, just like, me llamo Patrick. <laughs> and I thought I was Latin. And then I wanted to live in Latin America and I wanted to work in Latin America. I'm going to be following up for photo evidence at these moments. Oh, I have all oh, I've seen. <laughs> so good. I love that. Who are your mentors? You kind of touched on this earlier. I loved that you said that you also look for mentorship from younger generation. So tell me who's one of your younger mentors. Yeah. So my, <laughs> so funny. Um, my friend, Dan, actually, he, so I have, I, I, I'm very functional in my mentorship. So like I have certain mentors about career stuff. I have some other stuff. Dan has been really powerful because like Dan actually taught me how to dress. I call it DBD dress by Dan. This guy has great taste. And uh, my team at one point I was, I give it a lot of speeches and I was they were like, you dress very nerdy and I was like no I don't I just really cool and they're like dude diesel jeans and like new balance shoes and like a fleece no I'm not I'm Anthony I know it's Italian but I'm just saying like I dress like an HBS student I wear like like a button down and like with a fleece vest like I was dressing a bit like a startup guy which is fine but that's not going to like wow people when you're speaking in front of a corporate setting and so I called up Dan I was like Dan I need your help and he took me to some places in Soho and he's like buy that buy that it was like a it was like one of those movies from the 80s where like I try something and he'd be like and then I try another one and be like, and so he helped me with that. And he's also taught me how to use all the millennial words or the, you know, like how to say like bless up or extra. And like the, 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 we all know those now, but I'm always learning the new words and the new expressions. And I like that because I think it keeps, you know, you want to be understanding how culture is evolving. And so having a younger person who teaches you the ways of the young, you know, it's very good. Yeah. I'm so grateful for the team that I work with today who are mostly younger than me right now. And I learn so much from them. What were your shopping destinations in Soho? I must know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think all that extra, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff, but I'm built like a French man. So APC, Sandro, the Couples, went to the jean shop, rag and bone, um, frame. There's like a TV show. Coyo. Here Those happening. Are the ones. Like, there needs to be a YouTube series about this whole... Because there must be so many people, or men especially, I think, that do this whole... It's like the idea of... It makes me well, That's think why Trunk Club existed. Remember Trunk Club? Yes! And, but I did Trunk Club, and you know what? They sent me a box of, like, 10 things from John Bravados, and I was like, well, I could just do that myself. There's a store down the street. Yeah. But it's like, how do you pick the right items at the place and get trained on that? I totally agree with you. I actually have only come into my personal style and like understood what my aesthetic was in the last few years. And now it's very strong and like pronounced and I'm very colorful and pink is unapologetically my favorite color. It was always my favorite color, but I never owned it Yeah, because it was like, Ooh, pink. That's like not cool. and like too girly, you know? And so, and I actually, I worked, I think I told you this before, we started, but I launched social media or was part of the team that launched social media for Barbie. Mm. And when you work for Barbie, you literally wear Barbie pink like every day. It's an unspoken kind of thing. And so when I moved from Los Angeles back to New York, because Mattel is based in LA, my closet was all pink. And my best friend at the time came over and was like, well, to begin, we're going to remove all of the pink from your closet. And... That actually really fucked with my head. Yeah. Because I was then trying to dress like someone that I'm not. And so now it's really empowering, I think, actually to find your personal style and like have fun with it and know what, to your point, like how how to go into store and know how to shop and like pick the right things. I used to get like so anxious that I would like buy random things that like didn't go together Mm -hmm. and I felt like self-conscious about it. And now I'm like so confident in my style. That also makes me think of like clueless and share and like yeah. a makeover moment. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they, so, you know, there's a guy called Jens Greta and his wife's Emma and he's the CEO of Skims with Kim. Yes. And he, I saw him at a conference this summer. He also was the co-founder of Frame, which is, I love. And he said for men, I'm going to just do men. I'm not going to try to dress you ladies, but for men, you think of your clothing like a uniform and have your uniform that you go to because most guys, I mean, if you're really into fashion, like then you should live your dreams. But for most guys, like get up in the morning, I just want something that I know will work and that is cool. 
I don't want to think about it. I want it to be comfortable, but look nice. And so I have like the uniform set out and I know what it is. And when I go to the store, I know the stuff that fits. I have like four shirts that probably look like this and that's okay. No, that's so smart. It's a formula and it works because honestly, it's important whether you like it or not. It's important how you present yourself. You want to feel good. And when you wear great clothing, you feel good. You look good. It's just better. So if you were to pass on some advice to, let's start with an entrepreneur. Mm. What would be your, if you could give them one quick tip, what would it be? Oh, don't worry about people copying your ideas. The reality is that if they want to live your dream, it's going to take them 10 years to do it anyway. You know, so just build, don't worry. Okay, what would you tell an aspiring author? Oh, just write every day. Don't worry about when you write. There's no rules. Just write when you feel like it. And then if you do that every day, you'll have lots of content to turn into a book. Okay, last question. What would you tell a, someone who is graduating? Mm-hmm. Okay, go get some real experience at a company with a real name on your resume so that you always have that no matter what happens. And you can always point to the fact you worked somewhere re- that was like, you know, even if it was for a year, just get some experience at a company that's functional, learn how to work, and then do something on your own if you want. I do agree with that. I think it's gotten me a long way having worked for really notable brands. Thank you so much for your time. This was so fun. Patrick, you have been an absolute delight and I had so much fun spending time with you today and I hope to do it again soon. Thanks so much for tuning in, gamers, to Is A Game Podcast. Of course, subscribe to isagame.substack.com for bonus and exclusive content. We're seriously doing a lot of fun things over there in between episodes, including complimentary one-on-one 15-minute sessions with me once a week for one Substack subscriber. So get involved and also follow Is A Game Podcast on Instagram and TikTok.